Thank you. Something else to dislike, right? Oh. What's the other one? Because mine have always been sluggish after about late October. Then I didn't start. There's a presentation of jumping worms. Uh, this evening's speaker that we're sponsoring is Angela Gupta. She's a University of Minnesota Extension educator. Her specialty is forestry invasive species, and she's a woodland expert. She also sits on our park board as a board member, so she guides a lot of the things that are um, going on in the sage reserve trees. She's gonna be speaking with us for about an hour, and then um, fellow Master Gardener Beth Soli is gonna get up to do a shorter presentation. Beth and I started dialoguing this last summer when we both discovered huge invasions of jumping worms on um, the sites we were working at. Uh, mine was at a client's and hers is in her home garden. And we kind of dove into that research. So she's gonna be doing a shorter presentation on that and then we'll do a question and answer session afterwards. So think about the questions that you'd like to ask and uh, put our heads together on this issue. So please welcome Angie Gupta. Angie Gupta. Thanks. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I think I'm nicely mic'd back there. So right, I spend a lot of time, I, I'm office here in Rochester out at the Heinz Center um, at RCTC, and I spend a lot of time thinking about terrestrial invasive species, jumping worms being um, not exactly a new actor, but one that's got a lot more attention recently. So today's general overview, we're going to talk about invasive species generally, laws and regulations, because it turns out jumping worms amp opens a huge can of worms when it comes to laws and regulations. It touches on ever so many. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how to report them and some other tools that you can use. Uh, and then we're going to actually get to jumping worms. And we're going to talk about identification impacts, next steps, how to help policy and research. And there are some sort of brand new tidbits towards the end. So, so there's maybe some good news there. So let's just take a moment and make sure we're on the same page when it comes to invasive species. So invasive species are introduced non-native that cause economic, ecological, or human health issues. Okay. And so in today's world, there's a lot of moving, movement of materials. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that at length with jumping worm. And so this is how these invasive species get around. Now, uh, I, I wanna be really clear about what these are. So there are, there we have plenty of non-native species in Minnesota, some of which we have a great deal of love for, honeybees and apples, right? We take pride in these things, we, we support them, we sponsor them, we love them. They are not native, nor are they invasive. They're an economic boon often, um, a great deal of pride. Then we have invasive, so they're non-native and they cause harm. Buckthorn and emerald ash borer great, being great examples. All worms in Minnesota are invasive. So jumping worm is one of many, um, but that's where that lands. And then we have native things that we don't like, but they're not invasive. So poison ivy would be an example. Bronze birch borer would be an example. And then, I, again, sort of some clarity on language here. We have weeds. And so when I talk about the noxious weed law, a weed is any plant that is somewhere you don't want it to be. It doesn't, it, and so all invasives by definition are weeds, but not all weeds are invasive because you can have, so um, milkweed used to be a common agricultural weed and that's a native plant that now lots of people have a lot of value on because of its relationship to monarch butterfly. So it can never be invasive because milkweed is native, yet it is called a weed and it sometimes still appears on lists. All right, getting our terms straight. All right, so then talking a little bit about stages of invasion, because this matters for all invasive species and it matters for jumping worms. So um, at the top, we have things that are new or not present. So you have different regulations that tend to apply to new or not present species, and you have different management actions that you can take. Uh, so an example would be tree of heaven. Um, so a different one is emerging present but not widely distributed. We often think about these at the state level, but truthfully, you could think about this at the county or city level as well. Uh, so emerging, not present, one example would be oriental bittersweet. So we have it in parts of the state. In some parts of the state, it's really pretty aggressive, um, but at a state level, it's considered new and emerging. 
or emerging. And then we have things that are established. So they're, wi they're completely established, they're widely distributed. Again, at a state level, a great example is buckthorn. Um, in a yard, you could have a fully established jumping worm infestation in your yard um, that at a citywide or a statewide level might still be considered new or emerging, right? So there's a scale thing. But at each one of these steps, there's a different approach to management. Um, I will sort of just say this right now, there are no research-based management for jumping worms. So I'm gonna talk about the options for management, that plays into some of the regulations, but at this point, there is no solution to jumping worms. All right, so this is a, a basic pest population density chart. I think it's the only chart you're gonna see. Um, and so on the bottom you have time, and on the left axis you have pest population. And so uh, maybe not surprising if you can envision um, in a, a weed, for example, an invasive weed, then when you have only one in the landscape, it might be easy to walk up, pull it out, walk away, problem solved, right? As you have more of them established over time, the population gets bigger, you have fewer management options. Now you might not be able to pull it, you might have to spray it, maybe spraying isn't gonna work, whatever. You just have fewer options. So at some, see, oh look, I do, isn't that delightful? So when it starts to cause problems is when it gets to this economic threshold. Um, and so people start to take notice. Typically the media takes notice, you start having actual economic injury, so now it's costing money to manage it. You're having to you know, follow quarantines or restrictions. And so the sad bit of news here is the further up this curve you are, the fewer ma management options you have. You can no longer just pull it out, right? Now we're at a whole different scale of things. Um, this is often when the media hears about it and when the public starts to care. And it's really far down the sort of management curve, which is too bad. So I think that's about where we are with jumping worms um, in Olmsted County. And so we're still kind of down. We certainly, I don't think I've seen the full infestation level. I also suspect we don't have a good handle on its total distribution in the city or in the county. Um, but so it's creeping up. Now there are certainly, we're gonna hear one story of significant economic impact and injury to individual homeowners. That's a real thing, um, but as a community level, I don't think we're there. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, a lot of people seem a little baffled or befuddled about why they keep hearing about new invasive species, jumping worm being a great example of a new invasive species. And I maintain that climate is one of many reasons. So we have a much more transitory um, society at this point. We get goods and services all around the world. We're transporting materials all around the world very quickly and efficiently. Great for moving material. But we also have a very quickly shifting climate. And so this is historical precipitation data from 1890 to 2010. And what you likely to notice here is it is wetter in Southeast Minnesota today and that moisture is creeping Northwest. Moisture being a defining limiting characteristic for many species, right? So we have prairies to the West of the state and forests to the East because forests need more water than prairies. So as it gets drier West, you have more prairies. Um, so as you get wetter, you get more things that can move in. So I think that's part of why we're seeing more invasive species moving into Minnesota, because it's frankly more habit habitable, hospitable. Um, so that's, that's precipitation. Here are plant hardin hardiness zone maps. So 1990, 2006, all historical data. And what you see is that in 1990, plant hardiness zone three was northern Minnesota, plant hardiness zone four was southern Minnesota, so southern Minnesota was warmer. I think emerald ash borer is a really great example here. Emerald ash borer the world over has never been found in zone three. So back in 1990, had we known emerald ash borer was gonna show up in, in the United States, we could have reasonably said, we don't have to worry about it in Northern Minnesota and all those black ash swamps because it's not gonna be there, it can't survive. But since then, what we've seen is this creep, it's increasing temperature to the south. Um, and so now zone three is only about the Northern third of Minnesota, zone four is the center, zone five is the Southern third. So emerald ash borer can now persist in much, two thirds of the state of Minnesota. And this is old data. I suspect if we had a new map, we would have new data and it would be even further north. And so emerald ash borer is a good example, but again, cold is also a limiting factor for many, many species. So as we get warmer, we can become more hospitable for lots of things. And so I think we're seeing this combination of increased precipitation, increased temperature, better overall growing conditions, more invasive species across the board. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears to regulations. Yeah, this is a busy slide, you don't need to read it. The point is, it's a busy slide. 
So these are all, these are most, not all, because I didn't include aquatic, of the regulations that we impose on terrestrial invasive species in the state of Minnesota. So it's a complicated mess, really. And I would point out that we have the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Natural Resources. And so by and large, how this works is the Department of Ag regulates plants, insects, and diseases. And the Department of Natural Resources um, regulates aquatic species and it regulates mammals. Okay, so that's kind of a basic overview. And these things are divided out. Interestingly, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but the Department of Agriculture has management that are required for some of their species. I'll talk about that in a little bit. For DNR, the closest, there's never a you have to kill it, we have to remove it. There's rather a, a restriction on sale or transport or release. So pretty different in that way. Um, I will just tell you right now, I serve on the Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council as a statewide committee. And for many years, quite literally, no agency would touch worms, right? It's literally a can of worms. It's politically disastrous. It's a pain. There's very little, there's no known management. So like nobody wants it. And so that Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council um, really started writing letters and getting pretty active with the agency. Some, someone figure out who, if we're ever going to regulate this, is going to do that. Like at least figure out who amongst you might actually do this regulation. And so about a year and a half ago, it was finally decided that DNR would regulate worms if they were ever going to be regulated in the state of Minnesota. So I would just like to say that was progress. Um, and I won't give it all away, but there's more progress to report from the DNR now. So kind of one step at a time. Currently, worms, all worms, including jumping worms, land in this unlisted non-native species at the DNR. That is a general catch-all. Right, so what that means is these species have no restrictions on sale, purchase, possession, but they may not be introduced into a free living state without the approval of the DNR. Okay, so we'll see this a little closer up here. Um, so that's everything, right? I mean, that's your pet iguana, that's your pet snake, that's your goldfish. You can't release it into where it might survive, that's all. But you can sell it, you can purchase it on the internet, you can do whatever else. Um, and so the only way to, the only, if you wanted to introduce it as a free living state, please do not do that. Um, but vermiculture is worms, right? Um, you would have to get permits in order to release it into a free living state. So there's a process. That's where it lands today. Okay, so just general catch-all category. We're going to circle back. So I talked a little bit about the MDA. Um, so this is an example. There's kind of a similar process of the DNR. And this is for the noxious weed list. And so, you know, the commissioner has to decide that they might need to consider it. And so for most invasive species, it either has to be a known problem somewhere else, or we have to start seeing it in Minnesota and taking note and realizing it might be a problem here before anybody kind of takes notice of it, if you will. And then they make a decision. Um, it's often a big review. There's a research review. There's a committee involved. Should we consider listing it? Or, or not, and once a decision is made to list it, and again, the, first you have to go to the agency, then you have to figure out if you're going to list it, and then you have to figure out how you're going to list it. And so again, this is the MDA's weed list, but the similar process exists in both agencies, or all the agencies. So um, just a quick aside, because this kind of matters when we talk about what are next steps. Um, so the Minnesota noxious weed list is actually quite robust. And so um, we have an eradicate section of that, of that list. So plants on the eradicate section, like oriental bittersweet, you have to kill. So that's state statute. So if you have oriental bittersweet in your yard and you, it gets reported, you have to kill it. And the state might help you to do that, but that's the bottom line. And the idea here is that we can get rid of these species in the entire state of Minnesota, and then the problem goes away. So those have to be early detection species with very few li limited distribution. But that's pretty powerful, right? Uh, then we have the control list. So Jap uh, Japanese barberry is now on that list, a relatively new addition, if you didn't know. Um, and so what that basically means is if you have that on your property, um, you're not allowed to let it spread. So you have to control it, but you don't have to eradicate it, right? Um, and so that's what that means. And then this one are the restricted noxious weeds. So think buckthorn. So you're not allowed to sell it. You're not allowed to knowingly move it. You're not allowed to move propagating parts. So like, for example, it is technically illegal to have the female berry producers in the back of your truck taking them to the waste dump, 
right? Because those berries are viable. And so technically that is illegal. Um, so the idea here is you can't sell it, you can't spread it, you can't do all those kind of things. Um, and then we have this catch-all category, which now includes Amber Maple. Anybody maybe didn't know that? That's a new addition. Amber Maple is now on the specially regulated plants. This is a catch-all category for all kinds of things. Often those are kind of like compromises with the green industry. They live in that space for a few years. It's often a restriction on cultivars or varieties. And then they move up the list. So Japanese barberry just moved from specially regulated up to control. That was a recent move for that species. So there's a bunch. Um, sadly, the list keeps growing. Good job security for me, bad for everything else. So, um, so that's kind of that. So you know, there, is, there are lots of people that do invasive species work at the federal level. So the Minnesota state, various agencies pay really close attention to that so we can kind of see what's coming in. Um, so we, in, in my world, have been thinking about worms and jumping worms for quite a long time um, because we have seen what else has been happening. It tends to not make sort of the radar of everyone else until they start to experience firsthand, and that's where we are today. Uh, and then I just will say that there are also county, particularly noxious weed lists. Um, the state of Minnesota requires every county in the state to have a mandated agricultural weed inspector. I will tell you right now, Olmsted County doesn't have one. So if you wanted to write to your county commissioners and request they get that state mandated position, that would be super great. Um, because I think it's a real disappointment that we don't have that mandated position. Uh, but sometimes the county will have a different weed list. And some of those still have some sort of historically significant agricultural weeds like milkweed on them. And some of them are much more updated and robust. And there's a lot more active management. OK, so another Another t tool that could potentially have been used, and it, it won't be because it's, it's not regulated the MDA, but are quarantines. So the Minnesota Department of Ag regulates quarantines for pests. We have four currently on in the state of Minnesota. Emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, thousand canker disease on walnut, and mountain pine beetle. And a, the purpose of a quarantine is to reduce or eliminate the spread of a pest through human-assisted movement. And that is important, through human-assisted movement. So we can't prevent flights, for example. I mean, if a moth, moth or a beetle flies in from Wisconsin, so be it. Um, restriction, uh, restrictions of pest movement will, will, while also facilitating trade. And so as you can maybe imagine, inter, intrastate, interstate trade is a big deal. And the state agencies really have to pay close attention to that. And so quarantines are always sort of a political negotiation with the industry that might need those resources. Um, the basic idea, though, is that whatever material is being moved is moved clean. Um, and, and how that happens, there's a bunch of different ways depending on the pests. Again, this is now off the table for jumping worms. So unless something drastic changes, there will be no quarantines on jumping worms. There will no be restrictions of materials into the state. So quarantines, so this is an example of an internal quarantine on the left an external quarantine on the right. But these are, the, the map is a little dated, but it's gypsy moth and emerald ash borer are two internal quarantines. We know we have these insects in the state of Minnesota. Um, they're generally confined to these, they are confined to the most recently updated counties. Um, and so it is, it is illegal to move material outside of those quarantine zones if you don't have a compliance agreement, if you haven't met the rules and regulations and have paperwork about that. It is also illegal to move any materials that might have any life stages of these pests. So for gypsy moth in the North Shore, for example, gypsy moth females are pretty indiscriminate when they lay their egg masses, and they'll happily lay it on your RV or on your tires or on your camping gear. And so the quarantine actually requires that you, have, you do a visual inspection to make sure your gear is clean, right? So there's actually a quarantine on your gear if you are in those counties known to have gypsy moth. Um, there's no equivalent space for this that's going to happen in jumping worms, um, at least in the foreseeable future. But I think it's kind of important to understand these things because it turns out lots of things got bantered around. Um, so then we have an external quarantine. So the idea with an internal quarantine is you know you have these bad things. You, you can't, you're not going to win the battle in the places they are, but you can try to prevent the spread. Right? That's the idea. You're trying to not let those bad things get further than they are. 
An external quarantine on the right is we don't have these bad things and we don't want them. So keep them somewhere else, right? And so we have the thousand canker disease on walnut and mountain pine beetle um, are both quarantines. So they're external. So if you want to bring in pine wood from South Dakota, it might be infested. So it's not just the beetle, it's also the wood the beetle might come in, right? And so then you're gonna have to get paperwork in order to do that. Um, similarly, if you wanted to do um, walnut wood carving, you wanted to say purchase walnut online, which is really quite easy to do, it would be illegal to have that shipped unless it has proper paperwork that essentially is coming in clean. So that's the idea there. I'm switching gears. And it's kind of too bad all the questions are at the end, but Beth has to go. So that's the way it's going to go. So keep them tight. Um, if you have any of these things, at this point, jumping worms are not regulated. Worms are not regulated. But we do want to know where jumping worms are. And so one of the things I'm going to ask you at the end of the presentation and what you can do is to report them. Okay? And so there are three ways to do it. There are numbered because we really want you to do number one. And if you really can't do number one, then you can do number two. And in an absolute pinch, do number three. Right? Um, number three is our least favorite, and it's the least useful for jumping worms. But it turns out we all talk to each other. So the first one is the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. So I'd like to give a great plug out to our lovely public library. They have free wireless right here. So if you want to whip out your phone and download the app right now, I would be delighted. Um, and I see someone taking a picture. That's a really great way to save this information. So, um, so that's our first one, Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. That's our preferred way to do it. Um, and the reason is because we get those reports ASAP, lickety split. As soon as you upload them, they show up in my inbox and everyone else's. Um, the second way to do it is an online version. I know they have different names. I promise they're really the same system. So um, EdMaps uh, Midwest website, and then you can do it from a desktop, pretty, pretty slick. And the last one is kind of old school email and, and a phone number. Um, the good news in Minnesota, and I think we may be the only state that's this well organized, so yay, Minnesota. Um, all of our invasive species are reported in the same way. So if you find zebra mussel on vacation at the lake, it would be reported this way. Jumping worms, this way. Oriental bittersweet, giant hogweed, this way. It's all the same way, so thank goodness for that. All right, so the first of a several videos, excellent. Um, now I'm not going to talk. This was made um, further east of here about emerald ash borer, but same platform, all pests, so we're great. Uh, this is also really nice in that um, all of the pests that are in there, all the invasive species, there's also a little bit of information about identification. So let's say you think you have, think you have jumping worm, you realize you're a little, you're a little not sure about your ID. Um, there's a great way you can see some pictures and, and be reminded of some of the key descriptors, um, and that can help to reduce false reporting. The truth of the matter is, for many, many, most, almost all invasive species, we would rather you misreport something we don't care about than not report something we do care about. 
Um, and so this reporting system sends an email directly to people like myself. Um, we, if we, if, if the quality picture is good enough, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, then we can very quickly from our desktop um, confirm those. Some species, if, if you had something on the eradicate list, for example, someone actually might call you very quickly and, and help you manage that. For jumping worms, you probably wouldn't get a ton of follow-up. Um, because it's not regulated. Right now, we're just trying to get a handle on distribution and density, which may help the argument towards regulation. Um, so then it would come to an expert like me, we would confirm it or not, and then it would go up um, to this platform. Uh, one of the great things that you're gonna see here, this is the online system. It all goes to the same place. They're not duplicative systems. Sadly, they were all paid by different funding sources. They all have different names. That's sad. We've been trying to improve that. Um, so to report, you would do that at that tab. It's an easy form. You can upload pictures. Um, you can also find the nearest invasive species to you, right? And I'm going to show you a map in a few slides that has uh, the jumping worm distribution that we know to date. It's, I'm going to show it to you based on the county level because jumping worms and a few other species, not everyone maybe wants it tagged specifically to their address, right? Maybe you don't want to be the neighbor with jumping worms. Um, <laughs> And so I, I tell you that in that you can choose to protect that. And, and I know that Laura Van Ripper at the DNR will reach out to you before we would post anything and say, at what level do you want that information posted? On the back side, uh, there's a level of interaction that we professionals can see that can get us closer. There's only one species in the state of Minnesota that's so sensitive that even is super confined. Um, so anyway, so a little protection for people that are a little queasy about being out there. Um, you can do it, see it only at the county level. All right, so this is not a reporting system, but it is great. So I'm going to let you watch it, and then I'll... Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit What did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation details screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. So Master Naturals isn't a reporting tool, but it is a super powerful tool to learn what's around you in the natural ecosystem. And so we've been really pitching it to people who, again, are maybe embarrassed to, to misrepresent something. You're not positive it's jumping worm and you don't want to look like an idiot, although really we don't judge. Um, you can do this first and it can help you to figure out what it is or to at least feel more confident. Um, this uses artificial intelligence to offer you those first 10 recommendations. And then once you offer, let's say you think you found one, you pick it, you tag it, it goes up to a social media platform and then bunches of people all around the world, you and me and everybody else who cares, can go in and look at those and, and a, a worm expert or a mushroom expert will often go in and say, yep, you got it right or no, you got it wrong, I think it's this. And then you start to get feedback. Um, and so it can be really slick. This is for anything that was ever alive, right? So some of the master gardeners in the room, maybe you get some oddball questions and you don't know the answer to. Um, INAT is makes, makes you look really smart and hurry. Um, the other nice thing, if you're a landowner or a homeowner, is that you can actually set up like your property as a, a project or, you, I mean, you don't even have to do that, but you can. And then you can do like a biological survey on your entire property and it will store it for you here. And so you can go back and map it and see all the species that have ever been on your property or you can notice when the migration routes are, um, you know, um, it's super powerful and researchers are using the back-end data to help us understand like first citations of milk uh, of monarchs when their migration begins and ends 
And we on the backside can pull that data out because it's now citizen science data and we can look at migration changes, phenology changes. Um, it turns out the people that do like pot research, marijuana, um, want ditch weed so that that grows wild. Turns out we, they were able to pull it from the backside of this and then go out and find new gen genetics for, for marijuana. So it's a really powerful tool that we've been recommending people consider. Again, we have great internet here at the library. It's free if you want to download it. You could do that right now. Um, I will say the, the recommendation, the take home message is we want you to report invasive species to Great Lakes Early Detection Network. I will tell you that we're working behind the scenes to make it a little more slick. So that if things get reported here that are on our concern for invasive species list, that they would show up in our system a little quicker. Right now, it's like a download that happens sporadically, and then it's a huge data dump all at once. It's not, it's not real clean yet, but we're working on it. All right, so we've had talked about pictures. Um, now we want to make sure you do it well, because it turns out it really matters for us. And for all of these apps, you can put up multiple pictures, which really helps a great deal with our identification. All right, there we go. Finally, I'm going to get to worms. You guys were wondering, right? You, uh, so, so this is a general worm um, diagram from a colleague of mine at the university up in the Twin Cities, Lee Freilich. He's a very renowned worm researcher. And worms are ecosystem engineers. For as little as they are and relatively nondescript, they make gigantic impacts. And so this is a diagram meant to display that. And so worms change the soil, and by changing the soil, they change the plant characteristics. And we're going to see several more pictures of that, but really quite significant. Now I want to say just right now, lots of gardeners feel like worms are good. Okay, there are no native earthworms in the state of Minnesota. They're all invasive. Um, in forested ecosystems, some of our most intact ecosystems, the negative impacts of worms are clearest. So in your agricultural fields, which are tilled annually mostly, um, there's a, they're highly managed and manipulated systems. Worms might be beneficial, right, because they're doing some soil aeration. They might not, because they're also moving water and hydrology through the system faster. Um, but it's not clear they're as bad as they are in forests. Home gardeners often have a really lovely relationship with earthworms. Your home garden is a very manipulated and compacted and disturbed site. So your home garden is going to act a little differently than our forested ecosystems, which are hopefully pretty intact ecosystems. And so Lee Freilich is a forester like myself. His research is almost all out of forestry. Um, so this is where we know the most. And so worms change the soil. Soil changes plants. Plants change the herbivores that can live in those plants. So you get differences. And really what we're often talking about here is declines. Fewer plants, different plants. Fewer insects, different insects. That then impacts the carnivores, right? The small carnivores, they have less to eat, goes up the chain, and then your top carnivores get impacted. So they look little and relatively nondescript, but it turns out it's a big problem. So here, we're gonna listen to only about three and a half minutes from three, yeah, this is the one. Heather is back there working magic. Um, and so this is going to be a little overview of how these things come together and mix up and how we really have a can of worms before us. There, we don't know which buckthorn plants they're queuing in on, how far they'll fly, and we also don't know if, if we manage the buckthorn or the, the aphids on the buckthorn, what impact that will necessarily have to the populations in the soybean fields the next year. Thank you, Bob. This is the worm part. Let's take a look at who else finds a home on Buckthorn. 
Oat crown rust is a fungi, a pathogen that thrives in oats and barley, reducing crop yields by as much as 40%. When it's not on oats or barley, this pathogen lives on buckthorn, causing small brown leaf spots that aren't problematic to buckthorn. Buckthorn grows abundantly in the upper Midwest. It's everywhere. How did this tree that offers safe harbor for the soybean aphid and oak crown rust become so prominent? It had a little help from other species new to North America. These other new species came with the first European settlers way back in the 1600s on plants and in the soil. In the soil from Europe, there were earthworms. Earthworms are not native to most of Minnesota. They are not good for native forest as they gobble up the leaves on the forest floor, disrupting an ecosystem that coexists with the native plants, disrupting things like microbes, fungi, insects, plants, and wildlife. The European earthworm and its predator, the Asian flatworm, digest the plant matter and turn it into soil. This warm digested soil is inviting for new species of plants to move in. Buckthorn seeds like bare mineral soil, compounding the problem. People first brought buckthorn to North America in the mid-1800s and sold it as an ornamental landscaping plant. Buckthorn was planted in yards, in towns, and on farms. People planted it because it made a great hedgerow. If we only knew then what we know now. But there's one more non-native player in this story. In honor of the birds from Shakespeare's writing, a group of Shakespeare fans brought over European starlings from across the Atlantic, had a ceremony, and let them loose in Central Park. That was 1890. These birds took to their new landscape, and along with other species, helped spread buckthorn seeds. Seeds of buckthorn may look inviting to wildlife, but are not nutritious. The birds drop seeds on the soil that was made friendly for invasives by the advanced team of earthworms living and multiplying below our feet. Buckthorn gained a foothold, invading the landscape and the soybean aphid moved in, causing problems in the field starting around 2000. We use a number of techniques to manage soybean. Thank you. So the point with that is it's a really complicated system that we live in anymore. And so it's not just complicated by its own sort of natural indigenous ecosystems, but we have added lots of different players to this and worms have been one of them. And so jumping worms would be the newest player in that complicated ecosystem. So again, a different way to think about all this relatively quickly is so the worms change the soil and then has all of these impacts. Generally what you see is an increase of problems and a decrease of good things. Um, and the drought is it reduces plant tolerance to drought. And we're gonna see some soil characteristics later. These things have negative impacts, allergies and Lyme disease for humans. So we've hit that human indicator. Um, buckthorn has bunches of indicators for soybean aphid, lady, lady beetles. We have crop productivity decrease in crop and forest productivity in these whole systems. That's an economic. And then we have negative impacts on forest biodiversity. So we have environmental issues. All right, so here's just a couple more pictures about what really happens. Um, I would like to say again, this research is about worms generally. When we talk about worms in these studies, we're talking about worms that are from about six feet down, right? So from here to the floor. Um, and that's the sweet, the, hori the soil horizons in which most of our suite of Eurasian earthworms live in. And we have typically about 16 of these non-native Eurasian earthworms. Um, interestingly, when jumping worms come in, there's some research out of Madison, Wisconsin, that something happens and we don't know what, and you go from having 16 different species of earthworms in a six foot ho soil horizon to only jumping worms in a four to eight foot soil, a four to six inch soil horizon. Right? So what happens to all those other worms? And it turns out we don't know the answer to that. Um, but traditionally what we see is that you would have, this would be a healthy soil with multiple soil layers, soft, duffy um, top. It'd be real spongy to walk on. Madeline Island is still like this. Doesn't have worms, or at least not many. Uh, then once you get earthworms invasion, you lose all that sponginess. You lose that top layer of, of, of leaves and you get this bare mineral soil, you lose a lot of your understory vegetation, it changes. You have hard time with um, tree seedling recruitment and some other things, which really changes your forest composition, you know, 100 years later. 
All right. So, um, so this is a bit of a summary. So you get a loss of native biodiversity. It's hard to regenerate some of our native plants and a loss of habitat for ground nesting birds, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and small mammals. That's just with earthworms. Now we have jumping worms, right? So this is the map that you can get from that online resource, Ed Maps. And this is at the county level, because some people were squeamish about letting their addresses be shown. And so this is, as of last fall, um, all of the known jumping worm sites in Minnesota. And that is a significant uptick from a couple of years ago. So whether we, everybody started paying attention and we're finding them because we're paying attention or they truly are moving, we don't know the answer to that. Um, but the more information we have, the more likely we are to have regulations or management. Although there's still no, no management, but I have a little bit of good news on that. Um, so this is why we would want you to report so we can populate this map. Because remember, at the decision la la layer level, there has to be proof that it's a problem in order to regulate any kind of trade or, or any kind of materials. And so that's the playoff. OK, so jumping worms specifically. Um, really, you're going to see a lot of this from Beth, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. She's got great personal examples. Lots of people report significant soil characteristic changes where it starts looking like coffee grounds. It's real granular. Um, and so it's really a distinctly different. It, they can kill plants. Um, it, it, they may be feeding on the roots. Um, they increase soil erosion because that granular soil just slides away a little easier. Uh, and then it can be hard to grow plants. You're also, so remember, they reside in that top four to eight inches of soil where you're, you're this is an important soil horizon for plant roots, right? So any shallow rooted plant is going to be very impacted by this. And deeper rooted plants can be a problem too. Things like sods, if you have new sod and you're trying to get it to establish, that early root zone is, becomes very important. And so that's what's being impacted. Now, interestingly, you're losing all your other worms. Now, not that I really care. I don't like any of them, but it's really fascinating. Identification. So, um, uh, clitellum is this little white spot reminds me of like a collar. And so on all worms, they have that. On jumping worms, the clitellum is much closer to the head of the worm than to the end. So compare that to a night crawler. These are about similar size worms. So night crawler is like your quintessential, you know, bait worm for fishing, if that helps you. Um, and so here you can see that the clitellum is a little further down the body. It is also raised. So this one is fairly flat and flush to the bottom. It goes, you can see it all the way around, but it's flat and flush, a little bit more like a snake, if you will. Um, this one, it's called a saddle shape. So it looks like the saddle on the horse. So it's over about the top two thirds, but on the bottom side, it's nice and flat as if the saddle doesn't go all the way around. And so those are the two ways you can physically identify them. This video is really what most people notice though. It's this move movement. So I'm hoping Heather's gonna, excellent. Right. So that's where they get the name jumping worm from. They really are this active um, in the summer in particular. They can get a little sluggish late in the year, but they're very active. The other really fascinating things about jumping worm, remember all of those other worms disappear, but the total density of worms after jumping worms can sometimes be twice as much as when there was a whole soil, I mean like six inches of worms. So if you had, let's say, um, 50 worms in that whole soil horizon in a plot, once jumping worm comes through, you may get 100 worms. So they're living at the top where you and I are gardening and hanging out. Now there may be twice as many of them, and they're super active. And so lots of people identify them because of this movement. I'll also say um, that worms at my house, the jumping worms, are a little bit stiff. And they do kind of remind me of snakes in that swiggle. They're a little bit stiffer. They're not as floppy. Um, and, and then they're smooth on both sides because the, the, the clitellum is, is flat. So those are some of the ways that it has helped me to identify them. So um, if, if jumping worms were a plant, we would call them an annual in that they have only one life cycle per year. Most of our worms are what we would term perennial. They live year over year as adults. And this is really important when we think about how they spread. So this is a jumping worm that's mature. This is my house. Um, that is, this is July, August, and that's when they're most noticeable. They've reached full size, they're, they're big, and they're obvious. Um, so then they're going to live in my garden and my landscaping beds over the summer, and then in the fall, 
they're going to lay, we're going to go this way, they're going to lay, so they, this is early spring, this is the summer when they're biggest, um, this is in the fall, so these are not going to survive our winter. They're going to die, but they're going to lay eggs, castings, in that top soil horizon, and those castings are what are going to overwinter. So we can move them when we rake our leaves in the fall, right? You could inadvertently be moving those worm eggs in your leaf litter. So that is a concern for us. Then they overwinter as these little tiny poppy seed sized things. And then in the summer they emerge. They are tiny and very inconspicuous in the early spring when they come out because they're tiny little babies. And then they grow and they eat and they grow and they eat. And by July, August, we start getting calls. Um, and so that is their life cycle. It is a bit of a challenge. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about pathways because jumping worms is a gigantic ham of worms for pathways. So we have all kinds of natural distribution pathways for invasive species. So birds eat berries, berries get pooped out. Then you have things like oriental bittersweet. Um, we have things that have wings and can fly, like Japanese uh, or like um, gypsy moth and emerald ash borer. Then we have, you know, caterpillars that produce silk and then they blow away on the wind. That's how we got gypsy moth along the North Shore. It was a one gigantic storm from Michigan. They blew in. Uh, then, of course, we have things like dandelions, right? You wait too long, it goes to seed, and then next year you got that. So there's all kinds of ways things move. And then there's us. So take a moment, think about the ways we might move invasive species generally. And I hope your list looked a little bit like that. And so, um, so worms move in several of these. So we know all kinds of things, including jumping worms, can move in mud. So cleaning your gear is more than just making your mom happy that you're not marching it in the house, right? Turns out you can move a lot of stuff that way. Minnesota Department of Transportation has some really good data on the amount of stuff that can be moved on equipment. Now, mostly we're talking weed seeds here, but not exclusively. Again, gypsy moth is very indiscriminate where she lays her egg, eggs masses. Anytime you have trails for just about anything, you're getting a corridor of activity and you've got an introduction point. Um, anytime you have any material moved into a site, you have an opportunity. Jumping worm is huge in this regard. It's probably its biggest way, but it's not just one form of material. It's like a slug of them. So this matters. Um, I'm not going to go into this story, but the bottom line is even people can make a mistake. I don't know if you guys know what the, so it's clearly a pumpkin and it's surrounded by oriental bittersweet. The magazine was really clear not to use oriental bittersweet in its crafting, but the, uh, apparently the photographer didn't get that memo and the editor missed it and then they proceeded to run those pictures for years after we had informed them that they were wrong. So you know what, then there's just stuff that happens, right? I feel like that's kind of where jumping worms are right now. Stuff that's happened and we haven't figured out what to do about it. So this is my house. Um, we're trying to figure out how jumping worms might have gotten to my house and there are ever so many options. So I have mulch on a variety of landscape beds around my house. Some of that mulch was purchased at box stores. Some of that was purchased, or it was just gotten free from the mulch piles around town. There's, they're getting bigger because of emerald ash borer. It turns out that jumping worms, very unusual in the worm world, can live on cellulose. They can live on wood. Now, as a forester, I'll tell you, we do not have worms in our standing trees. That's not the way this works. But once those chips get to the ground, on the ground, they can be contaminated by jumping worms. It turns out the jumping worms can actually live in them. So once they get bagged and sold at the big box stores, they can survive. That is not normal for worms. So I have no idea. That is one potential source. Many of my potted plants, you can hardly see them, but I have some, some purchased flowers in that pot that were purchased around town. Farmer's market, local plant sale, whatever. Every spring I get some nice print annuals. So could have come in on the soil in the annuals. It could have come in on the roots of the annuals. Now that's in a pot. I will say delighted I have not found jumping worms in a pot yet. I don't know if you noticed, but I got my fishing pole in the back. I'll be honest, my boys are not allowed to fish with real bait because they're all invasive. So anyway, they don't catch many fish. Um, but the truth of the matter is lots of people fish with, with live bait. The proper disposal for all worms, including live bait, is the trash stream. So put it in a bag and throw it away. That's the proper way to do that. Um, we suspect many people don't do that. They live release on the, the shores. So that's a possibility. 
Um, here's my tomato plant. Again, sometimes I start them. This year I bought them. Um, and so this could have come from a couple of different places. Came in a pot with some soil. I planted it. Here's my backyard compost. Now it's on my house. The material comes from my house. I don't vermiculture, so there are no worms that came in through vermiculture. Um, but I'm pretty reluctant to use that anymore because I have jumping worms near it, right? And I don't necessarily want to take, even on my own house, I don't want to take what might, if there are jumping worms in my compost and move it to a different part of the yard. But worms are not super fast, right? I mean, I can sort of slow down the spread. So now I don't know what to do with my compost. And in my actual garden where I put my kitchen vegetables, I have historically gotten my compost from the waste, um, waste disposal site here at Olmstead County. So that is also a potential vector for my house. So I have no idea. I will likely never find out. Um, the problem is we probably all have a similar situation. There's all these ways that could have gotten there. And now it's my problem to not move them. So like leaf removal is a whole new issue at my house. Um, and remember when I said that they, they eat the, the wood chips? So it turns out they may prefer hardwood. So now I don't want to put hardwood wood chips down because I don't want to feed my worms, right? So I may just have to convert to softwood wood chips. Um, anyway, so it's really kind of altered the way I have to think about things. So let's talk a little bit about yard waste and compost sites, because it turns out this is regulatory too. Um, so Olmsted County Waste Energy has had confirmed jumping worms at our, comp our yard waste site here in Rochester. And so they have this lovely education and outreach. Rochester is a yard waste site. It is not a compost site. And it turns out these are regulated very differently at the state level. So a compost site has to, by state standards, get to 150 degrees. And they track it, and they monitor it, and that's the requirement. A yard waste site does not. So they don't have to report it, they don't have to monitor it, and there's no records about it. Now, I want to give kudos where kudos are due. Olmsted County has been working really hard to manage this so they don't spread it. But the truth of the matter is the same regulations don't apply. They're not obliged to do the same thing. And so when we take it from, if we, if we choose to get our compost from Olmsted County Waste Energy, there is a risk. And the way this works is your compost should be cooked to 150 degrees. That pr kills pretty much everything. It kills jumping worms, it kills the casting and the e or the eggs, the cocoons, it kills weed seeds, it should be good and clean. But if it doesn't get to 150, if it only gets to 110, you haven't killed those things. You get weeds, you can get worms, you get all kinds of stuff. So there's the act of, of producing the material and then there's where it's stored. Just like those wood chips, if the ground that the pile is on has worms, it kind of doesn't matter what the temperature of the pile gets, because now it's going to get reinfested from the ground. So that's like a complicated mess. All right, and so I hate to sort of say this, but we know that this is how jumping worms moved around Madison, Wisconsin. They got into the municipal compost spread all throughout the city, and now University of Mad uh, Wisconsin produces some of the best wor jumping worm research out there. Right, pros and cons to that. All right, so if you have jumping worms, like I do, don't panic. Take precautions to avoid spreading them, right? Remove and destroy any jumping worms you find. Experiment, what's working, what's not working. Um, what's surviving, what's not surviving. I mean, you may have to sort of go back to some of your, your thoughts and ideas about what your landscape's gonna be like. Try a variety of plants and consider alternative landscaping. Um, so particularly shallow rooted plants seem to be most impacted because again, all their roots are likely being impacted. Deeper rooting plants may do wetter, better once they get established, but they gotta get established. Um, and so log and share your successes because we're all going through it at this point and none of us have any answers. So we're learning together. So please spread the word to everyone else. Um, this really matters at like plant sales. If you do any fundraisers that include plant sales, we really wanna think about that pretty critically. Follow the research. I have some good news about that because this is a, a, a bit of a, a, we're still exploring all of these things. So what we want to, you to share with everyone is don't buy jumping worms. Again, it is still completely legal to order them online and have them shipped to your house, right? There's nothing preventing that. We know because we've done this and we've tested it, when people get vermiculture, so that's composting with worms, they might, they might for example, order red wigglers, which are common vermiculture worms that are not supposed to overwinter, they're not supposed to survive for us. We know that what gets delivered tends to be a hodgepodge of worms. 
tends to be any number of species, and most people cannot identify their worms. We know that jumping worms have been moved in worms sold as a different species for vermiculture. Of course, the idea here is that you might actually do the composting, say, even under your kitchen sink, but ultimately, presumably, you're moving that material to your yard to use, and then that would be the point of introduction. If you can you know, use all your compost under your sink, you're, no one cares. Okay, don't move the invasive species, and this gets tricky, right, with jumping worms, because they're kind of everywhere. Um, anglers, dispose of the unwanted bait in the trash. That's the answer. Gardeners, be on the lookout for the worms and soil potted plants, mulch and compost, and then that's when we would ask you to report. And vermiculture, please know your worm ID. Okay, so volunteers in citizen science, actively look for and ID these worms, report them to that Great Lakes Early Detection Network app, um, and for more, so this is really great. There's actually the Great Lakes Worm Watch. It was started out of Lee Freilich's lab at the university, and it has tons of information about worms, like more than you ever thought you wanted to know. Um, but one of the great things on there is it has a recipe so that you can go out and survey. And I would love it if everybody took a park or took a community garden this summer and went out and did this. And so the directions are online, but you basically, you take um, mustard powder, you add it to water, you shake it all up, you pour it on a, a, a square foot of, of soil, and then the worms start to emerge. And I'll tell you right now, jumping worms come up really fast because they're not very deep. So I haven't, I mean, in two minutes, I got all the worms I'm gonna get when it comes to jumping worms. The mustard seed irritates their skin and they come up quick. Um, if you don't have jumping worms and you have that whole suite of invasive species and you've got those night crawlers that are six feet down, it can take the night crawlers up to an hour to emerge to the surface. I don't necessarily care at that point. We've ever found jumping worms or we haven't. Super slick and easy. Mustard seed, best deal of town for bulk is people's co or good food store. Because really, you don't usually buy that in bulk. Um, so this is me doing this at my house in four different plots. I've been blessed to have low density of worms. We're going to see the flip side of that with best high density of worms. I have no idea why my low density. I've had them for two years. I'm going to just go. Uh, I'm grateful and lucky at right now. We'll see. This year could be a disaster. But this is me checking various spots around my house. I now know where they are, and I can track their population. It's pretty fun. All right, so research. University of Wisconsin-Madison has had a lot, of, a lot of papers about jumping worms. Um, the Invasive Species Advisory Council has been pushing the policy part of that fairly rigorously. MITPIC, Minnesota Terrestrial Plant and Pest Center, finally accepted a project. Well, they accepted a project. We're not going to say finally. They accepted a project to, to look at management options for jumping worms. And so it was just funded this fall. They start um, probably next month in February. It's a three-year research project. So, I mean, fingers crossed we learned something. Um, but I'm delighted to say that it did get state funding, so I'm really excited about that. Another update that I generally believe to be good news is the DNR, that lead agency on regulation, has actually written verbiage to change the regulation for jumping worms to make it illegal to sell. Um, the process goes, it goes to the state revisers. They have to clean up the language, and then it will go for public input. So that's when all of you guys could say whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea to regulate, um, and you could say why you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, and you can make comment on the language itself. So I, an extension, will make a point to make sure that master gardeners and other extension audiences know when there is that public engagement opportunity so you can say your piece. Um, I will say that we expect it to be a very controversial issue. So uh, the green industry would be impacted by any regulation that went on. I mean, they move lots of stuff around. Um, at this point, we've never regulated materials. This isn't going to be a quarantine. It would be regulating the species. But that could be pretty tricky, right? And so um, there are likely to be two sides of that. And I'll say we've had lots of concerns from some master gardener groups who have their plant sale as their only or their primary fundraising for the year. And this could really put a, a hamper on that. And so it's a complicated issue without a lot of easy solutions. All right, I just want to say there are no management, research-based management options for jumping worms. And again, more regulations. It turns out that if you were to Google management, you might find answers. And I would point out that pesticides are regulated by the EPA. And if it's not labeled for use um, for that species, then it's illegal to use it. There are no pesticides in the United States that are labeled for worms. So Google is not your friend here. Similarly, um, pesticides are also regulated by the state of Minnesota. So the, the EPA has to bless it, and then the state has to bless it. 
Similarly, fertilizers are regulated by the state and they have to be licensed in the state of Minnesota. There are no fertilizers that are regulated for the use for managing jumping worms. And so then it is illegal to use fertilizers, which again, Google may not be your friend here. All right, so final take home messages. Invasive species are a threat. You can help with prevention, early detection, rapid response, and management. Those are basic messages. Jumping words all apply. And so we're going to actually take questions when Beth is done. So I'm going to give it to Beth, and then I'll happily field your questions later. All right. That's the last slide. I'll go to the first slide. Hi, I'm Beth Soley. I'm a master gardener. Um, I've also had my own business, which I'm retired from now, solely for you, landscape design. And I'm an avid gardener. And um, in 2000, and, do you guys want to stretch a little bit? Just stand up. Are you good? Okay. Um, in 2018, I decided to update my backyard. And everyone was having these outdoor rooms, and I'm like, okay, I designed them for other people. Um, I finally took time to um, start, and I, oh, now let's see. I had training. There we go. So, here's my backyard before I started, and I dug up a lot of things, and one of the things I dug up, the worst thing, was jumping worms. Um, so here's the view of my backyard and and Angela kind of went through over the whole summary what jumping words are but I am um, the reason I want to give this talk is I want to help people to understand how it can be moved how and what to look for and to help the spread of it and I'm going to give you a little quiz at the end um, you're gonna um, say how many ways this jumping worm can be entered into my garden or moved. So you just keep track and we'll go through, just keep that in your mind. The quiz is at the end. Okay, so I remulched my yard in um, 18 and um, 2018 and oops, okay, I've got to get used to this a little bit here. Here we go. Okay, and so behind that stump, I have a compost pile. I dumped a lot of my pots. Um, and gonna spray paint the insides of them. So I dumped all my old potting soil back in that compost. I moved, I plant a lot of annuals in my perennial beds in between everything. Um, all these plants by my old deck, I moved to my other side of my garden. So I moved a lot of plants. Um, and I healed them in back over on the other side. Now I'm ready to start. I pull off my deck and I bring in a lot of equipment. I bring in um, um, people and wheelbarrows and cement. Bring in sand and more equipment. Bring in cement. And I've got pallets, and I got my stone. Oh, and I, you know, in I live right behind the country club. I back up onto it, and get a lot of deer running through. And also, the country club did a lot of work this year, where they lost a lot of trees, and they brought in new sod right behind my house. Okay, it was a cold, early, wet fall. And so winter came, didn't get the project done. It was supposed to be done. Then in the spring, this is where I'm dumping some of these pots. Now we're bringing in pallets from who knows where. And, and now I'm finally done with the patio. Now I'm going to start the landscaping. So I've got like a lot of clay. And I bring in 
the garden mix from Sargent's, which is um, part compost, part um, topsoil, and part sand. And I got a lot of clay. And so I'm bringing in uh, peat moss. And I use the county compost. So I'm digging and mixing, and I'm bringing in mulch. Oops. On this side. There we go. And um, that winter, before this, I went to Lee Friedrich's um, talk at the Congregational Church on invasive species. And it's the first time I heard that worms were not good for your garden. And I thought, that just ruins all my childhood gardening knowledge, and even worse for my adult knowledge. Where I, you know, so, and really, I have no worms in the clay. But because of that talk, I'm combing through the compost from the compost center. I'm combing through all this mud. And you know, I go way faster at a client's house, but it's my house. I'm, I'm just doing this. And then it rains every other day. So see those buckets over here? Those got water, and any time I found a worm, I'd throw it in the bucket, because I'm thinking, I don't want any worms. And it's just one or two, and you know, I, they're just the regular worms. Well, then I moved a pot, and oh, I'm thinking what the name of the plant is. I can't think of it right now. But it, I, bought, I put it for, as an annual, but it's a perennial, and then I'm going to move it into my garden. And it was probably in almost July, and I flipped it over and 25 of those worms were in there. And I just went, oh my God. And so I, Lee Frederick had talked about the jumping worms, and I go, could this be? You know, you just have this sinking feeling. So what do you do? You go Google it and you get pictures. And it's just like, you know, when President Kennedy was shot you know the time and place. It's four o'clock, July 15th. You know, I'll never forget it, you know, so, something, you know. And so, here's um, a video, and that's, and they move like a snake, and they're rigid, they're almost like a sausage, and they will fight you. I mean, the, so when I got them, then it was odd. I had to go to a funeral that day, and I put them in a baggie. They all got out of the baggie. And they would, they like, yeah, they're, they're kind of wild. And um, like they said, take good pictures. Like, like if I saw this picture, I wouldn't know that that's a jumping worm or not. So, you know, take good pictures in good light. Because um, then the one thing it saw was to call the DNR. That's all it said. And I'm like, okay. So I get a hold of them, and this is all new to me. I'm not pressing it. How come I... Oopsie. Okay. Then the other thing, you know, it would rain every other day, and so I got this, off of those dirt piles, I'd get this little crumbly stuff. I thought it was just the dirt washing. Well, when it said this coffee ground stuff, I thought, oh. So I went and took a little look at that, and then... I'm like, okay, now I'm thinking, well, at first I'm thinking, well, it's from the potting soil. So I had put the potting, mixed, you know, I showed you where I mixed in all these clay areas. Well, over by my compost, I'm thinking, I dumped all those pots in my compost. Oh my gosh, hundreds of worms. So then down from my compost, here's a ligularia. This is what it should look like. That's the same day. That's across the path. So it's like, okay, so then I dig under there. That's that same ligularia, and that's all the castings or the poop from the worm. And, and that's all the worms I found under that plant. And then, so it's kind of like the compost was the epicenter going this way. Then they had eaten the hosta worms. And I thought it was odd with all this rain that my hostas were smaller this year. They really should be huge. I mean, they weren't. You know, it, so then I dug under there, and then here's, here's just common what I found. So, you know, I'm digging in a spot, and they say put them in a baggie and let them die in the sun. Oh, that's too slow. I found vinegar up, I, you know, I needed a vinegar 
And then I also found that I didn't want to get all my garden gloves full of dirt, because now I'm like, am I transferring those eggs all over to all the spots? Because I'm doing so much, oops, sorry, I'm not good with this thing. So this was taken two days uh, before I found them, because I can look back. And this is all my projects, and I also do the Ronald McDonald, so I had a bunch of plants taken home that I was saving for them. And then I have, the grass was starting to, or weeds were starting to grow, so I decided to just tarp my yard so that, and then put the pots there, because it was so rainy. And then this is after I found them. So now my life has changed. Now here's my boots that only stay in my yard and they don't go anywhere else, so I don't transfer them. This is my baggie and my vinegar to like kill my worms. This is my separation tarp. On the one side, the worms had gotten in all my plants. The other side, those were still clean. I raised all my annuals up off the ground because now there's worms under the tarps. You know, I didn't see them on the tarps, but now I'm trying to keep them. Okay, these are my hot pads for my outside fire for only outside because now I got all these gloves all full of dirt. So now I'm like, I went to Goodwill. I bought a roaster to just put on the fire and boil my gloves. And then what do I do with all those dead worms in those buckets? So I, I boiled those, killed those, and I'm like, and I, I just want to say, you get all this stuff, and at first you're like, okay, first I was like, confused, and then I'm sad, and then I'm angry, and then I am possessed. <laughs> because, okay, every pot I went in, it, it like had worms, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. These are all supposed to go back to the Ronald McDonald house to save them money, because I'm the master gardener doing designs there and stuff. And okay, I've never burnt a plant with dirt, but it just got to be so much. And I'm like, okay. So, then back to just looking, you know, when you dig up a, a plant, so the worms are in there, and now they've, they've eaten the roots, too. Um, and you see how that, this is a, that's that same hosta, and it's weird, it's like, it looks like, you know, those little white things, they, they've eaten all that, and it has no feeder roots there. And I just, oops, I just... So then all of a sudden, you know, now I've just got, I'm on high alert. And I've looked, I have, anywhere I have mulch, I have jumping worms. But not so many in the front, but a lot by this compost, by that path. And this was a pulmonaria, and all of a sudden that doesn't look so good. So I, I dig that up. And again, no feeder roots. But then I see this little white thing. Now, here's the thing. I can't see good in dim light, and I can't see good close up because I got old eyes, but your phone can. And this is what I found. And uh, so here's like a baby. And, you know, it's, I'm pretty sure it's a jumping worm because look at it's, you know, and they're just eating. They just eat, eat, eat. And I want to show you the size when this gets done. There's another one. But it's, so it's, it's, I think the reason I found them was because I'm doing all this digging, right? I'm doing all this construction. But then I went into like, like they said, citizen science mode, you know? I'm just like, every day I think it just gets weirder. And, um, oh, do I have to go to the next slide? Am I? Yeah, there, that's another video. Oop. Well, we missed that one up the. Okay, so if you go, there's the one with that glove. One more. There, that one we haven't seen yet. So this is the size. I just have it because of glove. So they're. When they're babies, they're teeny, and you're not going to notice them, and they're clear. 
So, and you know, this was in the plant, you know, but like in that six to eight inches. But obviously the adults had eaten the, the ones. And, um, um, okay, now, we go, whoops. Okay, so this is in a plant, and I'm thinking um, if you would put that mustard solution in some plants you bought, so um, it would bring, you know, you don't, you're thinking of the big worms, but it could bring up the little worms so you could see them. And really, I had trouble seeing this, but you can see that's in a plant that I bought. But so I would video it, and then I'd go in at night after dark. Well, sometimes I had a headlamp, so I'd work till way into <laughs> the night. But then I'd go in the house, and then I would uh, look at my videos, and I'd go, oh my god, because I couldn't tell if it was a root or a worm. So um, these are my hostas now. They should be like much bigger and healthier. And you know, that's just one we dug up. And so um, some of you might know Cindy Tomaszek. She started the Hosta Society. She's a big Hosta gardener. And I learned through a mutual friend that she had them. So we um, got together. She came to my house. I came to her house. And she um, agreed to let me show her slide. She, I had never been to her house. She has a beautiful property overlooking this ravine and now this is like September so it's you know kind of fallish because you see the turtle heads blooming down there and um, okay this is this is what she found kind of the same thing and I don't know if we missed a slide we'll have to go back but um, but it was on this southeast corner. We both had the same thing. We're on the southeast corner where it's warm against the house that we found, and that's what she's picking up. And she, she really only mulches the paths. And I'm gonna go back one, yeah. So this is her southeast corner. So she had big, beautiful hostas in there. And I noticed when I transplanted, when I said I transplanted, I didn't think anything of it, but I had a clematis, and it had, its roots were, were like fingers, you know, no feeder roots. And I thought, that's odd. And it's that southeast corner. And then I thought, oh my God, all this composting, all these years, I finally have good soil. But I believe I had the jumping worms against there the year before, and they had made that so soft. So, this is a sad thing. I took all that good dirt and I mixed it in all my new beds because it was such good soil compost. Are you kidding? That's probably just the casting of the worms. But then I, and then I packed the compost against, or the clay against my house, because what do I do with all those buckets of clay? And this is another sad thing. I gave some to my neighbor, but she already had them because she lives next, to my, next door to my compost. But so this is Cindy's front yard. So she has a big, you know, it's fall again, so it's kind of rough, but a big, beautiful um, perennial bed. And it's a slope. So here's another problem that you're gonna see, and this could be in forest too. So this is down in there, so you see all the crumbly castings. Okay, so then, those are roots, so those should be underground, but the, the um, you know, the, I'm going to go back, I don't know if I did that right, the um, erosion, you know, when it rains, and you know how much rain we've had, so it's so soft. Those are all roots that should be under. Um, she did, she had cut that tree down um, because it was too big for that area. Oops, okay, I'm bad. But these are like new roots from like a hydrangea shrub. So you see the roots are above the ground. And so the castings don't hold moisture. I mean, it just, um, and that's, that's a close up of the castings there. So, so what do you do? And like they said, there's not any known thing, you know, chemicals to do, but, but you know, maybe like turtle head it, they didn't seem to affect those. Those have very 
dense, deep roots. I mean, I can't get a shovel hardly in to separate those. So maybe do that. Whoops, went the wrong way again. Um, I used to hate moles. I've chased moles for 19 years to get them out of my garden. I mean, I've tried tons of things, traps, you know, the poisons, everything. Now I love moles. Moles eat worms. So, like, let them be there. Um, if you notice, like here this, um, why can't I think of the grass? Um, Hakonia grass, see that middle grass? If you have something that's really little, oh, it's been root trimmed. You know, it could be. And so here's another example of that. So a lot of times I put annuals in, like I said, along my paths. If you see here, like I have some in here, like they're kind of tiny. Um, you might want to check there and then um, like, see how that's really little at the top? Like, why doesn't it look like that, you know? It's just right next to it. Uh, that's another sign. You might have something going on. So one thing you can do is, like, I probably won't ever put annuals in my perennial beds, but I can, I have this little thing, I can have them up. You know, you can put them up out of the ground so that, uh, you know, or even higher up out of the ground. Or even higher up out of the ground and make sure that, they don't, that the pot doesn't come in contact with the dirt so the worms can't get up there. And that can be your pop of color. Okay, so finally finished my project. The sod in there, but oops. Now my sod starts dying and I'm like, oh my God. I, and again, I can't see if those are worms or roots, but oh, there's, some of those are worms, baby worms. I mean, are they jumping worms? They're so small, I don't know, but something's eat them. Okay, so here's the answer to the test now. I, and it's a similar to what Angela said, but you know, my yard, all the green are the plants, the red are all the um, equipment. The gold are the, all the things I brought in. And then the yellow are all the people. So I had all the people with all the boots. Once I found out, I just told every contractor I had them. And I said, you know, what I had, if you don't want to work in my yard, that's fine. But, um, but you know, you just think of all that dirt. I had to have dirt taken out. Where'd they put that? Don't even want to know. And, um, and so I had people to my patio. I didn't let too many people in my yard except Cindy. But <laughs> no, and people wouldn't even notice. It was still, you know, my garden was still beautiful. I knew I had them. And, you know, this is just all new. So what's going to happen, you know, next spring? I don't know. You'll have to come to the sequel. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So Beth is needed at home, so she's going to take off. Um, but I am happy to field questions at this point. We covered a lot of ground. So they, are they just breeding all summer long? Yeah. And so. It's just the eggs that are in egg form at the end that. Over winter. Yep. Yeah. But there are multiple life stages during the summer. Uh, well, multiple, uh, they, they, they emerge as babies and they grow. Um, but we do think they have multiple times during which, I'm not positive we know, um, but if an individual lays its eggs and dies, but there are other individuals like on the backside, but there, it does appear that they continue to persist and lay eggs through much of the late summer. And then those adults will all die and they should not be overwintering. Um, and so then it's the eggs that overwinter. And it's un so in the world of insects, we might have a little bit better information about the number of times that insect life cycles might happen in one growing season. But I'll be honest, with climate change, we're seeing more insect life stages per year. And so even in really well-studied insects, we're having a hard time keeping up. And these are not well-studied. What's the mustard? Yeah, the mustard. Yeah, it's online. I, uh, um, Okay, at my house, it's um, the Kool-Aid pitcher size, which I think is two quarts to a quarter cup of mustard powder. Um, but it's online, usually do it by the gallon. So I do two of those, so then it must be, I think that's a gallon, a half cup, half cup of mustard powder to a gallon of water. 
Correct. It's an irritant, so it brings them to the surface. So at that point, you can one survey, do you have it or not? And then if you have them, quick, throw them away. I mean, put them in a bag, a cup or whatever, and then into the trash stream, because they're now up. But you saw some of the densities. And so Beth's story, frankly, is more typical than my story. And, it, and I suspect that most of the, you know, Beth's stories start like mine, and they don't get noticed until they're like Beth's. Um, but you're right, it doesn't, it's just a survey method. Um, I'm not positive, no, no. and which would be a, a reason why you get so many of them. Yeah, I, I'm not positive, and and so I may not know, and we may not know. So it turns out the 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 total amount of scientific knowledge on jumping worms is fairly limited at this point, uh, and so there it turns out there's just a ton of questions we don't know the answer to. Okay, thanks. You said the reporting was by county and not by Within that county, Alston obviously was all green yep. in that photo. Um, so how many cases? So the reporting is is actually by point, and so um, with I, I think with almost no exception, we on the back side, depending on your level of of um, ability to see, can see the individual point. So I can see I can see my front yard and my backyard, okay. for example, okay. right. Um, and, but for some of these, the homeowners haven't felt comfortable sharing that data to point level. And so it's hard for me to know um, how many total reports there might be because some of them aren't showing at the point level and they're only showing at the county level. So like Laura Van Riper um, has access to all of that. So to answer your question, I'm not positive I know. So um, I was the first to report outside of Olmsted County in fall of 2019. And let's be clear, I suspect because I'm one of, at the time was probably the only person in town who could identify them, right? Um, and so, um, I was the first report in 2018 October, and then this year there were a bunch more reports came on. So I think by late July we had five pin point specific points, and then I know Laura was taking a few more on the backside. So we're probably less than a dozen. I think it was horribly underreported. Um, and so one of the things that I just never quite got around to was I actually wanted to go to some of the community gardens and do some of the mustard seed and just see what came up, right? I mean, you have to be, private property can't go on, right, whatever, but there's plenty of public property. I'm on Parks and Rec. I've often wondered if the place where we put in new playgrounds, now we're using rubber and not mulch, so there's a reduced risk there. But any time we're putting in landscaping at this point, I kind of wonder if we should be going back and testing. Um, and I have many opinions about invasive species and how we should be managing at city level, but I'll keep most of those to myself for now. I think there's a whole realm of work that could happen here. What would be the best mulch? Right, so the research that I've seen out of Wisconsin is that they may have a preference for hardwood mulch, so then you're left with softwood mulch. And I really looked into this because I'm a forester, and like worms do not live in trees. Like, let's be clear, we got all kinds of things that look like worms that live in trees, but not worms. And so we had some like detailed conversations about this. Um, it's gotta be contaminated, right? It's gotta be coming in from somewhere. And so I'll tell you what my plan is. So the city is trying for the first time ever, I think it's called Chip Dump. It's a new, new service they're gonna have. You can sign up online. And um, then the, the chippers, the people that go around town cleaning up emerald ash borer and storm debris and all that stuff, they run that wood through a chipper. And apparently this service enables them to know where they can dump those chips right from the back of their chip chuck to your driveway. Now it's free, the, the downer is you don't get any say on when they come, you know, depending on where they're dumping it, that may be horribly inconvenient, right? Like in the middle of your driveway and now you can't get into your garage. Um, and it's a whole chip truck load. I mean, it's really a substantial volume. I noticed on there I could have a preference. So I frankly am gonna try this and I'm gonna pref prefer softwood and then see, and then the, the nice thing for that is there can be no point contamination, right? The tree goes into the chipper, chipper to the truck, truck to my driveway. I may regret the whole thing. Um, <laughs> they shouldn't be in the tree to start with. They shouldn't be in the tree, and there won't be contamination, right? The reason that they're chipping them is because they've fallen. Because most of the trees in town at this point are emerald ash borer removed, so I'm not going to get those. Those are hardwoods. So what I would be looking at would be any softwoods, so spruce, firs, pines, pre predominantly, that have been either deemed hazard trees or storm trees. 
And so you're right, they could hit the ground. And most of those um, are taken down before they hit the ground. And I mean, there are drug. I mean, there's always a, a, a possibility. But in the grand scheme of things, and the other thing I've really been thinking about in the free mulch piles around town, so um, I don't live very far from the South Zumbro one. And that one is on, it's on um, uh, crushed rock, gravel. And so I haven't tested it, like my, my mustard test can tell me, but I suspect that would be a really inhospitable place for worms. Um, so I actually suspect that particular site may be better than others. Um, now, of course, I suspect most of that is ash, which is a hardwood, which is then, I think, more desirable for jumping worms. Great questions. Anybody else? Yeah. So what do you do if you have landscapers coming in? Yeah. Right, so as a consumer, we can ask any questions we want and we can be as demanding as we want. Now at some point they may walk away, right? Um, but as a consumer, I would, I would absolutely ask your landscaper what they're doing to prevent invasive species, what they're doing to prevent jumping worms. And if they look at you like you just dropped in from Mars, like red flags maybe should go off in general, right? Because they, they should know um, about invasive species. If they don't know jumping worms, I mean, they would certainly learn a lot before they left my house, right? I mean, they'd get the whole spiel. Um, but then as a consumer, I might start putting stipulations on what I would allow in or not allow in. And the truth of the matter is it's not regulated. So you're just doing that as a consumer. Um, and I, there's no recourse. I mean, if they bring it in, unless you have it written in a contract, which I suspect would be a challenge, there's not much you can do but complain, I suspect. So, I mean, it's, it's a wicked issue, right? Is there any way for them to clean their equipment? Yeah, so there's great recommendations for cleaning equipment generally. We talk about this across the gamut. Um, and so the most robust ways are water. So if you can think of like docks will sometimes have their clean water spigots to get rid of things like um, zebra mussels. So you can do very similar things with landscaping equipment and logging equipment and agricultural equipment. The problem is, very few people have access to that, that high pressure water, which is what you would use. Um, and particularly once you're at your house, they gotta clean it to leave, that would be the recommendation. So then the next best thing is to really scrub it down. So this is where you get a broom, you get a scrub brush, you kick it off before you leave. We're gonna own right now, we're not getting it all. There will be dirt on this equipment. Um, now, the more we can get off, the less risk there is, but none of this is risk free. And that is the standard recommendation for all invasive species. So this is the same message we're giving loggers, we're giving roadside workers, um, the mo guys, they're all getting that same, that same message. Yeah, when you mentioned about uh, washing things, a friend of mine uh, and her concern for jumping worms, when she would buy plants this past year, uh, and let's say she bought hostas, she would take them, take them out and put them under water, you know, get all the dirt off, which she thought she was doing, and then repotting them or planting them. So yeah. what do you think about that? I think that's probably your best bet. And so worms, the reason we see worms after rainstorms is they're not aquatic. I mean, they have to breathe. And so they essentially get flooded out. And that's when they surface, right? And so you can do that with regular water. So if you're worried about moving them in and you're going to buy plants, um, I think that's a pretty good approach. You get rid of all the soil, you dump it, or you know, you, you douse it, and you take any worms that you see and get rid of them. I think mustard, frankly, I mean, how much mustard do you want to go through? Like, how big a friend are you going to be at the good food store? Um, but that would be another way, because that is a real irritant. Um, it, and so... Just do that within a pot. Yeah, pot. just dip it. And now, again, it's, it's bringing them out, right? And so it's not foolproof. I mean, some of those, you know, we've been worried that they may actually be embedded in some of the roots that are a little harder. Now, they're trying to escape. They're, they're irritated. It's uncomfortable. Um, but right, if you do that and you can get them all out, the other good thing, I mean, water, there's no toxic byproduct of water. Um, you know, we're not... That we're not recommending you spray your whole backyard in mustard powder, but we're unaware of any major issues with the mustard powder mix, and that's really standard survey stuff for worms. So we don't know of a lot of like negative consequences. So I think that's her, your best bet. And then to really think about where you're getting your soil. If you're bringing in any soil, where is that coming from? Um, because 
you know, they're tiny when they're first born. So uh, maybe my eyes are still a little younger and so I can see them, but you can, once you know you're looking for, see those little tiny baby clear worms. They're impossible to identify. Lee Fralick, has, he, he can't tell either. He's like our worm guru, right? Uh, he can't tell at that, that age. But um, where you have jumping worms, there are no other worms, right? So if you can confirm one is a jumping worm, you can pretty much be sure the rest are. I mean, that's not 100, you know, there's a transition period where there might be more than one, but by and large, where you have jumping worms, that's it. And again, we don't know why that, is. I mean, so, so there's one theory that there might, they might carry a virus or a, a, a biota of some sort that kills the rest. I mean, it's kind of fascinating that they hang out only at the surface and they kill things six, six feet down. I mean, what the heck is that about, right? But they do. And the other downer is they appear to invade much more quickly. So there's an interesting research project out of Madison. It, they had jumping worms in the Arboretum, and it was a four-year project, and I think it was 20-some-odd 20, 20 acres, which is fairly large by worm standards, right? And um, they started the project, and by the end of the four years, they went from having earth, a, a suite of Eurasian earthworms in like 95% of all their plots in year one and by the end, there was only, I think, one plot that had any Eurasian worms left in it, and all the others were jump jumping worms at almost twice the worm density, which is like super crazy fast. Now, there was a bit of a slope, so one of our hypotheses is it's, it's moving over, over land on slopes, and we have that hypothesis about any number of invasive species, like gravity helps them. But it turns out jumping worms are like shockingly fast. Yeah. Capture that water because you're yep. washing the eggs yep. into that water and then you throw that water into the line. Yeah, no, it's a good comment for sure, right? Down the drain. One of the things you mentioned a long time ago. Yep. You gotta watch the water that you pretend And we don't know how long those castings might be able to survive in that water. So then it Well so hopefully it's going to the waste uh, to the the um, the water treatment plant. That's the word I'm looking for. Well, so it's going right down your drain with everything else. Um, and so, I mean, if we want to go down that road, there's other invasive species issues at your waste treatment plant. But, um, but I mean, so then hopefully you're going through enough. And we don't know the survival rate, right? So by the time you put it down the drain and it gets to there, there's a chance they've all drowned. I mean, the, the adult worms can't live that long. So you're really talking about those castings. And I would say we don't know the answer to that. Yeah, then it's a little different, right? And if you throw it down your storm drain, it goes into a river somewhere. Um, so I don't think we know. I mean, for the worms, the adult worms, yes and yes. Um, for the eggs, we don't know. And the eggs are tiny. Like, I mean, even the researchers that are like tasked with trying to count these and find these is, whoa, uh, it's a little bit nutty. So you're unlikely. I don't know that I've ever seen an egg. I mean, if I have, I probably couldn't distinguish it from the dirt it was in, right? But it, the disposal matters. You could boil the water just like sharing Yeah. Yep, you could. Somewhere these things are needed. Where are they needed? And where do they not cause problems there? Or what do they do when they're needed? Yeah, so it's a great question. So they're native to Japan and maybe, maybe the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I don't know about the problem part of it. I mean, so the truth of the matter is, it's, it's actually really fascinating. So Amur, we have Amur maple, we have Amur cork tree, we have a bunch of Amurs. That is a river valley in China. That's where they're getting that name. And it turns out that, that um, China has a very similar ecosystem, so highs and lows and winters, to us in Minnesota. And so, um, but they have a much more complicated ecosystem, so there's a lot more um, uh, types of species within each layer. So if you think of a forest, you have your herbaceous layer, you might have a mid-story short tree layer, and then we might have a, a top layer. Um, in, a, in a diverse rainforest, you're likely to have five canopy layers, right? Uh, in our forests, they're relatively simple in that there's not a lot of competition at any of those levels. Well, it turns out that for reasons that we don't maybe completely understand, there tends to be a lot more competition in some of these Asian spaces. And so that makes them very competitive here. And again, for reasons that we don't know, but we wish we would, we did. So if you ever notice, um, in early spring and late fall, pretty much everything that's green is non-native. 
So your buckthorn, your honeysuckle, whole bunch of stuff. None of those are native. And so there's this, for, for reasons we don't understand, North America seems to have a delayed spring leaf out and an early fall, fall drop. So that means all these other species, both Europe and Asian, tend to have up to, I mean, buckthorn's looking at six more weeks of growing season every single year. So that just, out, I mean, they got six weeks of advantage over our natives. And so we don't really understand why. So there's got to be some advantage for our trees to not do that, we, but we, it's not clear what that is. Yeah, so the 150 degrees is pretty high. Um, and so, I mean, maybe. We were talking about burning up here earlier before the presentation started. And so um, th there's another invasive plant, Palmer amaranth, which has been a big deal. It's a big deal to farmers. And it turns out um, we've had a couple examples where it went to seed. We didn't get early enough. They've been blowtorching that, and it kills the seed. They've been very successful. The seed, of course, is sitting on the top, right? So I'm not, not sure you want to go out and blowtorch everything because they're going to kill everything, right? Um, but I frankly. I don't know. And so we, we do a lot of pre prescribed burning in our forested ecosystems, and it doesn't get rid of our worms. I mean, if, if it did, we would be prescribed burning all of our hardwood forests. I mean, we kind of do that anyway, but that would be a, that would be a management for an invasive species. But, but you're talking about they're, they're way down deep. Well, so the jumping worms aren't that deep. I mean, so it's a good question. I don't think we know the answer. So and how intense is that? I mean, so a burning is just one way to create heat. But like my electric blanket is definitely not getting to 150 degrees, right? Um, so I mean that's the compost answer though. So we had a new invasive worm in Florida recently in the last five years, and the only thing that uh, it was resistant to was organic soil, and so I didn't even worry about it in my yard because I had 20 years. So was it crazy worms? It's the same species, I think. Is it? Yeah. So it's the same species. Oh, is that a different name? Mm -hmm. we, uh, it turns out that name is not very sensitive. <laughs> so we are not calling it that. <laughs> but yes, it is called that further south. <laughs> Well, so it's interesting that you use that. Again, um, if one were to Google, one might find recommendations to use an organic fertilizer. Um, and it turns out there, there is no research to support that. Um, it is illegal. Uh, I got that confirmed very clearly last fall. And uh, right, it was quite the agency, I mean, whatever. Um, I learned a lot. So, uh, so, but if, and truthfully, the limited research that has been done about a couple of products, um, they have interestingly been organic fertilizers. Um, have not, it hasn't played out to be a good solution, right? So, I mean, so the, the okay, I feel like I can say this a little bit more. So, the MITPIC project, the Minnesota Terrestrial Invasive Plant Pest Center, who just funded a project, funded it, it went in the project proposal process to look at organic fertilizer as a treatment for worms. So can, if we can prove it works, then we can go to the agencies and see if it can get regulated, right? Uh, since then, the fertilizer company has taken it off the market because it knew that people were using that product for worms, and that is illegal, and it did not want the EPA to come back on the fertilizer manufacturer. So where I'm going with that is, I mean, I don't know if... Well, you, I know. So if you truly didn't have anything, I think you might have been lucky because we haven't had that example here. I mean, forests are organic by nature, like pretty much nobody dumps chemicals in a forest. So, and yet we still have lots of problems and they have shown no resistance to organic forest soils. They just plowed right through that Madison one. I honestly don't know. I assume she's just meaning healthy and intact soil that, horizons. The diatomaceous yeah. earth would, is the real sharp kind, right? Would that be? I don't think it matters. I mean, our experience with worms are once they get introduced into an ecosystem, I, I don't know that any of Lee Freilich's were, has said that one soil, like clay versus sandy versus loamy, I think worms are pretty tolerant. And they're eating whatever's there. I mean, they're There, 
would be greater certainty that we're getting what we, I mean, that they're getting there. Um, I don't know what that entails. Right, and I don't know what it entails from their perspective. I, I mean, I want to give them credit. They have been working with us, and it turns out they've had a couple other weed issues that were on the eradicate list. I mean, so pretty wicked stuff. And they've worked really hard to try to solve that. So if you've noticed, their entire compost piles have moved. I think that was jumping worm, right, to get those away from a known infestation site. So they've done a lot of work. Um, but ultimately, I mean, the answer is yes. If we knew and there were public record that we were getting to 150. Um, I will say, though, that one of the people that hasn't been to the table is the MPCA in Minnesota. They have been often very quiet about invasive species. This causes me and my peeps in anxiety. Um, and they have been unwilling to share with us the data on co composting temperatures. So they have, we think, collected them, but they have not been willing to share. So as a consumer, I mean, one solution was if you know that that composting source is properly heating it and they're getting, you know, year over year, they're getting to that temperature, then I could be like, I'm, going, I'm willing to pay a premium. Like, I'm okay to drive that extra 20 miles. At this point, there's no way for you to know, which causes us anxiety. MPCA, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And that same invasive species, uh, Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council Board has a letter drafted to the MPCA asking them, there's actually a quite a lengthy list of species that could go into this, um, but to please ask them to come to the table. So again, maybe, maybe you don't care, but it is illegal to put um, yard waste into your waste stream. Uh, but a couple years ago, a plant called poison hemlock, which is incredibly poisonous and ingested and was the plant that killed Socrates, started showing up in large numbers. Um, it also doesn't compost well. The chemicals that cause all of this actually do not go away in the composting process. So that is a poor solution. And yet it is illegal to put it into your waste stream. So what is the right answer? I would point out there is not one. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least not that's legal. And so we said, MPCA, can we reconsider the yard waste garbage issue can we can we put it and in a place like Olmsted County like come on already we're burning it we're not compost I mean we're not landfilling it um, and it turns out the um, the uh, water treatment plants often use Phragmites a European um, Phragmites which is an invasive species as a part of their bio Right, exactly. So if you start mapping invasive Phragmites around the state, you can also map very quickly where all of the wastewater treatment plants are. And so we've really been like, MPCA, can you please come to the table and let us talk about these things? And they've been pretty resistant. Okay, maybe that's more than y'all wanted to know. We're working. Is it legal to put um, noxious weeds in your garbage? No. Garbage mustard, things that... Nope. So, uh, well, okay, so the answer is no. Um, but it turns out that the Olmsted County Waste Energy, Energy um, Plant has in their specific permit with MPCA the ability to put in a small amount of yard waste. And so in Olmsted County, they have given us permission to put our poison hemlock into the waste stream. So here we have an answer. Um, most counties do not. And so they have, I know they have told other regular users of garlic mustard disposal to not. So like Quarry Hill, for example, can no longer take their garlic mustard to waste energy because they won't take it anymore. And that's a relatively new law. I think it was 2012, I think it was. And I'm sure it was for landfills. And like, I am very empathetic to that. Like, I don't think our grass clippings need to be in the landfill. We're not talking about grass clippings. No, it's a bit of a mess. Um, so I don't honestly know exactly what they're doing today, but the short-term answer was that they had been putting it in garbage bags and letting it sit around until they got hot enough and then hopefully were rotting sufficiently. I mean, it's a super icky, yeah, it's an icky mess, right? Um, right, so it's, it's a quandary. And I mean, so we, I, I do this kind of a lot and that disposal issue is a gigantic problem. And we've been trying for years to really get a better conversation about that. And the good news is MPCA does seem potentially interested to talk to us, particularly because of the poison hemlock issue. I mean, that is a huge human health issue. And it also, so it, that same plant, if ingested by like cows, 
can cause fetal abortions. So now we have a dairy industry problem. Okay, I, okay, you're still here. I can ask more questions, but it's like going on eight o'clock. So you guys are very, a lot of endurance. Any more? Yes, and people have been taking them. Yep, yeah. With jumping worms, we haven't had we haven't had any reports of jumping worms. But I mean, you saw those pictures, right? Yeah. Um, so we have had no confirmed reports, um, but I suspect no one is looking. It's it's they're almost exclusively in people's yards. But how close those yards are to their forests, I can't tell you, right? <laughs> Right, right, yeah, but it's, it worries us. Now, I will say a bit of good news about that, though, is that if, if you can potentially imagine a scenario where um, if jumping worms get rid of all the other worms in a forest and we can then figure out how to manage jumping worms, you could intentionally put jumping worms in a forest, get rid of all the other worms, and then kill the jumping worms. Okay, so this is like when we are like, do the happy dance in my world, right? <laughs> And I'm like, oh my gosh, we can get rid of worms. Uh, we're a long way from that, but like, if we get there, we'll be using biocontrol and eradication all together. Uh, oh my golly. It's good jobs security. <laughs> Horrible monsters that don't invite me to your house. Thank you. Every time somebody says we don't have invasive species, uh, it turns out I can pretty much always prove them wrong. Yes. Um, just one thing. Um, I'm wondering if we should have a policy recommended to master gardeners about moving equipment from one side to the other. Let's turn off your mic. Yes. You want to? Yeah, I think that would be great.